Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. The Lord bless every one of us in Jesus' name. Now you understand, this is the beginning of the half of the year, latter part of the year. And so we're going to do something in our development. I'm starting a new series that we need to understand as we just spoke about earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. I want to examine with the church, with the leadership, the faith that the Lord is calling us to contend for so that we'll not be beating about the bush. I've been praying and thinking about it for a long time. And it so happens that I decided that at the middle of the year, I will start the series. And it just lines up beautifully with what we learned last week. So we're going to take the strand from here, that he, from that passage, we're going to take that series coming from that passage and then moving on so that you will know what you are defending. You will know what you are contending for. You will know what you are protecting. And you will know what you are preserving. And the Lord will give us understanding in Jesus' name. That's good, but let the church say another amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today. We bless your name because you have preserved our lives until this time. You've given us a commission and you've given us your revelation. And this revelation you have given us, Lord, will preach it in Jesus' name will protect it in Jesus' name, will propagate and spread it everywhere in Jesus' name. The strength, the courage, the backbone to earnestly contain for the faith you give to every one of us in Jesus' name. We will not fade out by the wayside. We will not fall. We'll keep on standing, standing up for the truth that you have committed into our hands as ministers and as members of the body of Christ in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see marvelous, matchless, wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Jude, verses 3 and 4. Jude, verses 3 and 4. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful, necessary for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 4, you see one of the things we're called upon to defend, to preach, to promote, 
and to protect. It's the grace of God. Look at that verse in the middle. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And that's what we need to protect. The grace of God. Without that grace of God, we don't have salvation. Without the grace of God, we don't have his favor. And we don't have his mercy. Because the grace of God is the free or merited love and favor of God. And if anyone comes and he turns that grace of God upside down, and he turns it into lasciviousness, then we have lost the very source and the very foundation of what God wants to do in our lives. Grace is the spring and the source of all the benefits humanity will receive from God. Anyone a sinner? Anyone a saint? Anyone born again? Anyone not born again? Whatever we're going to receive from the Lord is from the grace of God. And if that grace is turned unto lasciviousness, and the grace is made cheap, and the grace is mutilated, then we will not be able to have what we ought to have. Grace is the divine influence that renews the heart, that constantly restrains us from sin. We have no other way, and we have no other strength. We have no other possibility of being restrained from sin and living a righteous life and living to get to heaven if the grace of God is not understood. It is grace that grants us peace with God. It is grace that grants us reconciliation with God. It is grace that reckons Christ's righteousness as ours. It is grace that transforms and imparts the new nature of obedience to the believer. It is grace that opens the door of heaven for us to live eternally with God. It's all of grace. We're looking at Acts chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 11. Acts chapter 15, verse 11. In verse 11, but we believe, we Jews, Peter was saying, we Jews believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, the Jews, shall be saved even as they, the Gentiles, the Jews, the Gentiles, to be saved is the grace of God. And he said, this will believe, and this will sure up, that if any Jew is going to get to the kingdom of God, it's going to be by grace. And if any Gentile is going to get to the kingdom of God, it is by grace. We must defend that grace, protect that grace, understand that grace, earnestly contend for that grace. Chapter 11 of Acts, Acts 11, verse 23. Who, when he came, and had seen the grace of God. When he came, he had seen the grace of God. He didn't describe their place of meeting. He didn't describe their sanctuary. He didn't talk about the beauty of their worship. He didn't talk about any other thing. He said this is what he saw, the grace of God. He was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart 
they would cleave unto the Lord whatever we have as a church whatever we have as a part of the body of Christ if the grace of God is not seen at the foundation of the ministry if the grace of God is not seen as to the preaching of the word of God if the grace of God is not seen as to what we believe and the essence of what we emphasize then all is lost look at what he saw who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad how did he see that he saw that in what he said he saw that in the way they express their confidence of getting to heaven that it is not by the works of their hand he rejoiced and was glad because he saw that they based everything in their lives and they based all their teaching and they based all their conviction on the grace of God and he was glad the Lord will be glad concerning us Acts chapter 13 verse 43 Acts 13 verse 43 now when the congregation was broken up when the meeting was ended and then the people are going to their houses many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God to continue in the grace of God very important that we start with the grace of God that's how we get saved and we continue in the grace of God that's how we have the strength to serve the Lord and we end a journey in the grace of God that's how we have assurance that we'll get to those through those heavenly gates and we'll get to heaven I'll be there Acts chapter 20 and I'm reading from verse 24 Acts chapter 20 we're reading from verse 24 it says in verse 24 but none of these things move me neither count I in my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my cause with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify here's the ministry he had received here's the ministry we have received to testify the grace the gospel of the grace of God it says persecution yes I have a fair share of that trouble I have a fair share of that and opposition it says I see that everywhere it says but you know that does not move me all I'm looking for all I'm praying for all I determined to do all I'm diligent about is to continue and to finish well preaching the gospel of the grace of God verse 32 now and now brethren I commend you to God and to the word of his grace very central in our teaching very central in the proclamation of the gospel I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up without grace we cannot be built up it's the word of his grace that builds us up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified by faith sanctified in christ through christ by christ and through our faith you see the centrality and the importance of the grace of God tonight we're looking at the message the marvelous matchless grace of God the marvelous matchless grace 
of God. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the possibilities of God's manifold grace. The possibilities of God's many-sided faith, grace. The possibilities of God's grace that does and accomplishes many, many things in our lives. What are the possibilities of grace? We'll see that. Point number two. The perversion of God's marvelous grace. Grace marvelous. Grace matchless. Grace meritorious. Grace that mediates for us. If some people will pervert that, turn it to lasciviousness, and destroy that grace of God or our understanding of the grace of God, it brings a terrible consequence on them and on us if we accept their perversion, the perversion of God's marvelous grace. Point number three, the price of God's matchless grace. The grace that has come to us that cannot be matched with any other thing or by any other thing, matchless, incomparable to any other thing. And what the grace of God does in our lives, no other thing can do, matchless grace. The price, how did that get to us? How did we have that matchless grace? The price of God's matchless grace. Number one, tell me. You are going to say that again. The possibilities of God's manifold grace. Let's come back to Jude, verses 3 and 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation that we get by grace, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that he should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men, it says, I'm telling you this, I'm exhorting you, that you will earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints, because there are certain men crept in unawares like serpents they crept in and they came in and without anybody noticing them but god knew this because it was prophesied before who oh, are before of old or age to this condemnation ungodly men they are turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Manifold grace, First Peter chapter 4. I read from verse 10. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As every man has received the gift, free gift. Even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The manifold grace of God. Second Corinthians chapter 9 we're reading from verse 8. Second Corinthians chapter 9 Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace, all sides of grace, all shades of grace, all areas of grace, all the possibilities of grace abound toward you, that ye always have been all sufficiency through that grace, 
We have all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Whatever God has ordained for us to do, every good work, there is grace available to get it done. The possibilities of God's manifold grace. First Corinthians chapter 15. In First Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul says, am I a teacher of the word? He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Am I a minister, an effective minister? He said, that's not my strength. That's not my ability. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Am I a competent evangelist? And I go to places where other people have not even named Christ. He says, yes. But I am what I am by the grace of God. He says, have I got revelation of the mysteries of the kingdom? And I reveal that as the prophet of God. He says, yes. But understand it's not of me, it's all of grace. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Am I an apostle? And I've gone beyond, and I've done much more than all the other apostles that were before me. He says, yes, I can say that, but understand, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And then he goes on to say, And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. But the grace of God, which was given me. You understand the importance of grace now? As we look at the manifold grace of God. Let me point out to you, number one, the grace for free and full salvation. The grace for full and free salvation. Romans chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 23. Romans chapter 3. We're reading from verse 23. It's a grace that provides the free and full salvation. In Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And no one will be able to have salvation except by the free gift of God, grace of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace. No salvation without that grace that is free. No justification without that grace that is free. And there is no sense and understanding of forgiveness without that grace which is free. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare is righteousness for the remission, forgiveness, cleansing of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time is righteousness that ye might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. The way you have salvation is that you look up to God and you say, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. It is all of the grace of God. My trying, my struggling, and my efforts cannot grant me salvation, cannot grant me justification, cannot grant me regeneration. It is all 
by the grace of God. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be justified by faith. We are peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. We have access. We are able to enter in, into the kingdom. And we have freedom now, forgiveness now, salvation now. By this grace, where he will stand, I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, by grace, reading from verse 1, and you, I see quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins. Think about this. How can a dead man produce the action that will make him come back alive? No, not possible. It's dead. And he wants to come back to life. Even the desire is dead. The ability that's dead, skill that's dead. It says every sinner is dead. And for him to come back to life, the life of God, that is not going to be on the basis of the action of a dead man, dead in the soul, dead in the spirit, and dead in his conscience. It says, and you as he quicken, he has to do it who are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. He said, the prince of the power of the air has held every sinner captive. And in that cage, in that imprisonment, he cannot free himself. Only grace will do it. Verse 3, among whom also we all had a conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of death, even as others by nature as the fish by nature swims as the bird by nature flies as the lion by nature devours other animals so man by nature the sinner by nature sees and he cannot go against his nature. Then he says in verse 4, But God, would have been lost, but God, we would have continued in our degradation, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, as quickened doors together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. Preach that grace. Publicize that grace. Expound that grace. Tell the sinner about that grace. And show every guilty one that it is grace that will bring them out of that guilt. By grace are ye saved. Verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, not anything you have done. Not anything you're doing. Not, not anything you have achieved. Not anything 
you will achieve. Salvation is all of grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. The possibilities of God's manifold grace. Number one, the grace for free and full salvation. Number two, the grace for faithful and fruitful service. The grace for faithful and fruitful service. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. In Titus chapter 2 from verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation as appeared to all men teaching us that denying of godliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Our lives begin to serve the Lord as our light shines. And we live a life that is free from ungodliness, free from worldly lust, that is sober and righteous and godly in this present world as our light begins to shine and we're living the victorious life then people begin to notice that and our life is rendering service unto the lord bringing others to salvation then it says looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us and is still all by grace. This is what we receive still by grace, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works now we can serve the lord and our zeal all by grace our fervency all by grace our desire to see other people saved is all by grace it's not something we generated in our hearts by ourselves by grace we're saved by grace we're sanctified by grace he makes us purified as a peculiar people, zealous of good works. First Timothy chapter 1. In First Timothy chapter 1, I read verse 12. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me. He has enabled me. Any service I render, I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. I mean, the ministry because the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant towards me. Verse 16, how be it? For this cause I obtained mercy, the grace of God, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 
says it's all by grace. Faithful service by grace. Fruitful service by grace. First Corinthians chapter 3. In First Corinthians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. According to the grace of God, you see that? You are serving the Lord, grace of God. Others are tired, they are not tired, grace of God. Others appear to be dull now. They've done so much, they cannot continue. But are still continuing, grace of God. You still have the passion that more sinners will come into the kingdom, grace of God. And you're preaching and preaching and preaching without relenting grace of God according to the grace of God which is given to me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another builders thereon but let every man take heed how he builders thereon for the foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. It's all by grace. Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Others are teachers, but they are not pastors. By the grace of God, Paul was a teacher as well as a pastor. But it says, I don't have anything to be proud of over the other people who are teachers and not pastors, or their pastors and not teachers. For me, it's the grace of God. Other people are pastors only and not evangelists. Paul the apostle said, I'm a pastor. And for the Corinthians, they have no other father. For the Galatians, I'm their pastor. And I give birth to them in the gospel. That I'm a pastor as well as an evangelist. I have nothing to go glory of. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Other people are teachers. And they do not have revelation concerning the rapture concerning the Antichrist, concerning the second coming of Christ. They just teach only what they find reaching in the world. But Paul the Apostle, a teacher, a pastor, an evangelist, a prophet that tells us we shall not all sleep, but in a twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed he said, it's all by the grace of God. Other people are pastors, but they're not apostles. And Paul, the apostle, says, I fit in to the position of an apostle. And the signs of the apostle, the Lord demonstrated in my life. But he says, I'm not proud. Why? For by the grace of God, I am what I am. And the grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. But the grace of God which was with me. God will give you grace. Everything he has ordained, you will be, you will do. By the grace of God, you will be. You will do. You will accomplish in Jesus' name. So stop looking at yourself. I don't have this. I don't know this. I don't know that. By the grace of God, you will be who you will be. Hebrews chapter 2. 12 verse 28 Hebrews 12 verse 28 wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved 
let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Let's have grace that we will serve God acceptably and courageously. The Lord will make it possible in our lives. The possibilities of God's manifold grace. Number one, the grace for free and full salvation. Number two, the grace for faithful and fruitful service. Number three, the grace to face the fury of Satan. The grace to face the fury of Satan. You see, Paul the Apostle, he faced the fury of Satan, but it was all by the grace of God. And whatever persecution, opposition, trial, the devil may raise up against your life, against your ministry, your light will not be quenched. Satan will not stop you. The more furious he is, the stronger you will be. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations given to him. There was given to me a son in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And for this sin I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Paul the Apostle said, I have received abundance of revelation. And you can see he wrote Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then began to write to the various churches. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, and all the other apostles put together. They did not write as much revelation as he wrote. And he said, It's all by the grace of God. And because of that, Satan fought him. But he won. I see a winner there. I see a conqueror there. Satan concentrated on this man and buffeted him and buffeted him. And he prayed once, second time, third time. Look at verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. His grace is sufficient for you. Whatever happens to your family, grace will be sufficient. In your place of work, grace will be sufficient. In your body, buffeting and buffeting, grace will be sufficient. In your ministry, grace will be sufficient. You will face the fury of Satan you will not bulge. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather rejoice in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. I even rejoice in reproaches and i'm glad when i see these necessities in persecution 
I feel strong. For he says, in this crisis, it is for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, tell me, then am I strong. Let the weak say, you'll be stronger and stronger in Jesus' name. It's all the grace of God. Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 14. It says in verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Can I be like that? Can you be like that? By grace, you will. Verse 14, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and tell me say it, say it for yourself find grace to help in time of need the need you went through today and the need you are going through today in your personal life, in your family, in your ministry, that makes you to feel, where is my God? Where is the answer to prayer? Where are the great things we have heard about, the miracles we have heard about? Tonight, you will find grace to help in the time of your need. What you might face tomorrow in the ministry. What you might face any time in your life. From now till you pass on to glory. Nothing will ever happen that will swallow you up. You will find grace to help in the time of your need in Jesus' name. I rejoice with you. The Lord has brought you into the kingdom at such a time like this you'll be growing stronger and stronger in your life in jesus name let's come back now to jude and we're reading from verse four point number two the perversion of god's marvelous grace the perversion of god's marvelous grace look at verse 4 for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the perversion of God's matchless grace. Number one, the perversion of the saving grace is the grace of God that brings salvation. But that grace of God that brings salvation teaches us that we deny ungodliness we will not continue in sin but there are people that creep in into christian assemblies and they turn the grace of god into lasciviousness look at mark chapter 7 reading from verse 21 turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Mark 7, 21. 
For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit. Tell me the next word. Lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. There are some people that say, we're saved by grace. And grace is in our lives. And so lasciviousness, search, fornication, a tree, deceit, wickedness, sinfulness, worldliness, everything can remain, it doesn't matter. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. They pervert the gospel. Galatians chapter 5, I read from verse 19. Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. In verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, tell me the next word, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There are people that creep in into the assembly of the people of God and they say whatever they preach, holiness without which no man shall say the Lord, I know I have the grace of God. And whatever I do, idolatry, witchcraft, heresy, hatred, wickedness, fornication, I, um, I, adultery, they say it doesn't matter. The grace of God is there. Those are the people, they cannot inherit the kingdom of God as they continue in that perception of the grace of God. They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Ephesians chapter 4. I read from verse 19. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with, with greediness. These ones, their consciences are dead and they have no feeling anymore. They sin with impunity. And it says they have no feeling that they are, they are not guilty about anything. And it says lasciviousness has come into their lives. They work all uncleanness with greediness. And they still profess they have the grace of God. Those are the people. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. First Peter chapter 4 I read from verse 3 first Peter chapter 4 reading from verse 3 for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in the past in lasciviousness lusts excess of wine, revelings, 
banquetings and abominable idolatries wherein they think it strange that she run not of them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you those who say they have grace they're saved they're eternally secured as they have been saved once even though they have lapsed into lasciviousness they say it doesn't matter and they look at those of us who avoid and flee all the works of the flesh oh they say that's legalism they say he's trying to get saved by his good works no not at all we're saved by grace and grace produces good works in our lives the perversion of saving grace number two the peril of cheap sinning grace the peril of cheap sinning grace look at romans chapter 6 romans chapter 6 we're reading from verse 1 what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound what's the answer god forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into jesus christ were baptized into his death therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life you've got the grace of god walk in newness of life don't pervert the grace of god for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin you will not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin verse 11 likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto god through jesus christ our lord let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey each in the lost thereof verse 14 sin for sin shall not have dominion over you sin shall not have dominion over me for ye are not under the law but under grace for those who are under grace sin shall not have dominion over them what then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace was the answer god forbid know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death if a believer a child of god who has been saved by grace if he goes back to sin he says you become a servant to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness but god be sent 
that ye were servants of sin were in the past, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Amen. There's those who pervert the grace of God and they make it sin in grace, there's peril for them. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Galatians 1, verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. He called you into the grace of Christ, but now you are so soon removed to another gospel. Some people say, once you are in, you're always in. Look at this. They were removed from him that called them into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which he have, which were preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. People tell us in their false doctrine, nobody can forfeit the grace of God. You're saved by grace, you're always saved. No, those are perverters of the gospel. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. One, the perversion of saving grace. Two, the peril of cheap sinning grace. Three, the perdition for superficial grace. The perdition for superficial grace. For the people that say they hold the grace of God, but so superficial. It doesn't have a transforming effect in their lives. And they are saying they're saved, forever saved. Grace is still there. Although every form of sin and lasciviousness is being practiced by them, the perdition for superficial grace. Second Peter chapter 2, I read from verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately, privately, that's how they do it, they say they stay in the private to pervert the grace of God, to pollute 
the word of God to corrupt the calling of our faith. O privilege shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, bought them, bought them. They were saved and bring upon themselves sweet destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways if we don't defend the grace of god if we don't set right the proper understanding of the grace of god if we don't earnestly contend for the grace of god in its proper perspective many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of who oh, and stroke of righteousness shall they with faint words make merchandise of you you will not be a commodity for them to sell whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnations lumbares not. Their damnations lumbares not. Luke chapter 17, verse 32. Luke 17, I'm reading from verse 32. Remember Lord's wife. She came out of Sodom and she was told by the two angels look not behind thee grace has brought you out and the husband said if i have found grace in your sight they said yes you found grace but don't look back and the wife looked back and became a pillar of salt remember lord's wife there's perdition for those who are holding on to cheap, superficial grace. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the walking of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. There are people who think that anywhere so-called healing, deliverance, is taking place everything is all right and they go there they see occultism in his nakedness and they see satan worship in fullness and they see blasphemy and they see that they are walking by the spirit of the antichrist but they say well i want to get healed satan will not heal you i'm talking to you and the antichrist will not perform any miracle in your life in jesus name it's better to die in the hands of jesus than to live in the hands of satan you didn't answer that one even him who's coming is after the walking of satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved for this cause god shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but at pleasure in unrighteousness you'll not have pleasure in unrighteousness 
Second Peter chapter three, verse five. Second Peter chapter three, reading from verse five. It says, "For this, they willingly are ignorant of the people who hold sinning grace, superficial grace." And they do not have the intention to get to the real grace of God that will save them from sin. They are willingly ignorant. They don't want to forsake their lasciviousness and their evil. And so they are going about to convince other people, don't let me go to hell alone. Come with me. I cannot get into the real grace that sets us free and keeps us free. And so I don't want to be alone. Come with me. You will not go with them. Verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished for the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You will not join them. I will not join them. Your family will not join them. My family will not join them. Our church will not join them. If we are the only people preaching holiness by the grace of God, Holiness that changes our lives. The grace that transforms us. If we are the only people in the land, in the country, in the continent, we will not be ashamed. We will not join the perpetrators of false doctrine in Jesus' name. Grace is marvelous. Grace is matchless and grace is mediating that's what mediates between us and god i come to point number three the price of god's matchless grace the price of god's matchless grace this grace we're talking about what's the price we get salvation free, but somebody else paid a price. And this grace and gift we're talking about that comes to us free is not cheap. Christ paid the price. Number one, much less grace through Christ's sacrifice. Much less grace through Christ's sacrifice. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for his so smelling savor. That grace was paid for by Christ, by sacrifice, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, not jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, 
much less grace through Christ's sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the, since the foundation of the world. But now once in the age of the world as he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's what he did. Sacrifice of himself. And because of that sacrifice, that's why you want to treasure that grace of God, knowing Christ page with that for that grace by a sacrifice. Chapter 10, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. He offered one sacrifice, and it is that sacrifice that has purchased for us the much less grace we're talking about. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 9. Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crouched with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death. For every man. He paid for it by dying. And that grace has not come to us, much less grace, because of his sacrifice. Number two, marvelous grace through Christ's suffering. Marvelous grace through Christ's suffering. The suffering of Christ that brought the marvelous grace greater than all our sin. And now he saves us. Now he sanctifies us. Now he justifies us. Now he purifies us because he suffered to grant us marvelous grace. Luke chapter 24, verse 46, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. The third day he suffered and he rose the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. As we talk to people about repentance and faith in Christ, and tell them salvation is available through the marvelous grace of God. Let's remember Jesus paid for that was suffering that no tongue can tell. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. We're reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 3 from verse 18. In verse 18, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer. He has so fulfilled. All the prophets spoke about that, that the Lamb of God will suffer and thereby take our sins away. And it is that suffering that knew no limitation, that now makes salvation available. It's a great price, marvelous grace through Christ's suffering. Repent ye therefore. Because of that price, repent ye therefore. Because of his suffering, repent ye therefore. Because of the price Christ has paid, 
to grant you this salvation by grace. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Verse 26, unto you first God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. That's what great does. Grace does not leave us in sin where it met us. Matchless grace, marvelous grace, mediating grace will not leave us in sin unto you first God having raised up his son Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. It tells us in Acts chapter 17 Acts chapter 17 verse 3 Acts 17 verse 3 opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered to grant us salvation Christ must needs have suffered to take away our sins Christ must needs have suffered it was a necessity that's how the grace of God came to us free he paid the whole price opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Christ is Christ what's the consequence was touchy Bastachi, and at times of this ignorance, God winch at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. There are people who say, Christ has paid the price, Christ has suffered. We don't have to repent, just believe, just believe. And whatever sin you commit now, even after believing, God doesn't see your sin anymore. He has, uh, he's looking at you through Christ so you can continue in sin. He has forgiven your past sins, your present sin, your future sin. Blasphemy. He says, because he has paid the price, the times of your ignorance, he went at. And now he says, now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Number three, mediating grace through Christ's sorrow. Mediating grace through Christ's sorrow. You know the price he paid? He paid the price of sorrow. Sacrifice, suffering, sorrow. That's why we don't toy with grace. We don't toy with the salvation that grace has brought. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. He was going to pay the price for salvation. Sorrowful, very heavy. Then says he unto them my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death tarry ye here and watch with me you cannot toy with the grace of god if you understand what sorrow jesus went with you cannot hold grace in one hand and all your sins with the other hand if you know what sorrow jesus went through in Luke 
Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 41. Luke 22, verse 41. And he was drawn from there, about his stones cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony when he was to pay the price, looking forward to the cross, how he will bear that. All the sins of the world, of the people of the world, being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The vessels inside, the nerves inside, the heart was broken. And because of the brokenness of all the veins inside, that's why the blood oozed out. Sorrow. And that's the price he paid. You cannot toy, you cannot joke, and you cannot make jest of the grace of God. Knowing what price he has paid, the mediating grace through Christ's sorrow. Lamentation chapter 1. Lamentation chapter 1. I read from verse 12. Lamentation chapter 1. Reading from verse 12. In verse 12, is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by, see his sorrow? See his suffering and see his sacrifice. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by and you make the grace of God to be so cheap and to be superficial? Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by and the grace of God to you is something you can toy with? Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold and see. If there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, behold and see. Look at my sorrow and look at the depths of the sorrow of Christ. If there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord has afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. His anger on the whole of humanity. He laid it on Christ. And he had sorrow, he had suffering, and he sacrificed himself so we can be saved. Now the grace is available. We can be saved, sanctified, we can serve the Lord, and we can walk carefully and circumspectly, and we can walk in the light of the gospel because of the grace that Christ paid dearly for. I pray this grace will be precious in your sight in Jesus' name. And all the possibilities of faith will be effected in your life since the price has now been paid. Manifold grace, marvelous grace, much, much less grace, mediating grace, all available for you today because Christ paid it all. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Protect, preserve, contain earnestly for this grace of God. We need to open our mouth tonight. We have had a lot. It's not time to go out. We want to settle down and pray. Our Father in the Lord has declared unto us that from this other part of the half of the year, that the Lord will be leading us in a special way. 
And it's such a great privilege that God is calling us into this special series. It's no time to go out. We're ministers of the gospel.